383. The end is near. The following day, Eric had to attend a cocktail party sponsored by a business associate. He went alone, not wanting to subject Emma to such a tedious event. Inside the luxurious country club, the wine was flowing. The guest list was exclusive, with only the top tier of New York's business talent in attendance. One of the men at the party approached Eric with a glass of wine. You've been the talk of the town lately, he said. Eric recognized Charles Bozeman from previous events. Eric just smiled. I hear your daughter is a huge fan of one of my boy bands. If you need my help, feel free to ask, he said. Charles flushed at the mention of his star-crazy daughter and smiled awkwardly. That's very kind of you, he said. Where is your lovely wife tonight? She prefers the peace and quiet of home, Eric responded. Mr. Bozeman discreetly gestured toward the center of the room. I'm not sure if you know, but Mark Hilton is over there making some interesting comments about the industry. I thought you might want to hear what he's saying. Thanks for the tip, Eric said, and he headed in the direction that Charles had pointed. It wasn't hard to spot the small crowd of men and women around Mark tittering at his every word. A woman in a short black dress inserted her own commentary, her wine glass tilted precariously in her dangling hand. If you believe in that kind of thing, she said, I've heard that voodoo comes at a steep price. How tragic it is that some people are willing to risk themselves or their family to become a star when they're so clearly not meant to be one, she said, not sounding as though it was very tragic at all. I know, right? That's why I had to get out of that whole situation as soon as possible, Mark said. Then he continued in a lower voice. Truth be told, if not for the pressure from Kaleidoscope, I would never have agreed to have her in the film in the first place. Another woman laughed and said, Keep your voice down. Her husband is here today. Ooh, I'm scared, he joked. This is a business world. I've got to make my decisions based on what I think is right, and connections need to be used appropriately. Time will prove that my decision was the right one. I'm afraid time will never make a stupid decision look like a smart one. The entire group jumped at the sound of Eric's voice, shifting awkwardly once they realized who was speaking. Eric, Mark said with a tight smile, acknowledging his presence but not apologizing. You were very quick to suggest that you needed to replace my wife because of some superstitious nonsense, Eric said. Have you ever considered I might have a few tricks up my sleeve? He took a sip from his glass. Perhaps I can see the future, he said. And I see that Hidden Expert will come to an end tonight. Mark's face flushed as he gritted his teeth. Your prediction is a bit harsh, he said. Wasn't your rumor about my wife a bit harsh? Eric asked, his eyes glittering dangerously. That was the work of the media, Mark said dismissively. I had nothing to do with that. Really? Eric asked. Are you sure you didn't work with someone to deliberately spread rumors about my wife? Are you so sure that the security of your cast is guaranteed? Mark took a step forward, his chest swelling with indignation. If you continue threatening me, I will be forced to take action. Seeing the tense atmosphere from afar... A woman dressed in an elegant white dress approached the group and asked Eric, 
What's happening here? Is everything all right? Everything is fine, Aunt Lori, Eric responded. We're just dealing with some private matters. As long as nothing's wrong, she said and walked away. Mark looked between the woman and Eric in confusion. Did you recognize the woman who just left? Eric asked. That was John's mother, but... He paused to take another sip from his glass, enjoying the anxious anticipation building behind the other man's eyes. She is also my aunt. I wonder if I ever mentioned to you that John is my cousin. Mark's eyes grew wide in shock as his heart nearly jumped out of his chest. You were right, Eric said. In the business world, connections should be used appropriately. He raised his glass at the group. I wish you all a good night. Mark was left frozen in the wake of Eric's departure, unsure what to do. Hidden Expert was designed with John in mind. If he leaves, everything will be destroyed, he thought in despair. He slid his hand over his face in regret. I should have known something wasn't right. Eric was much too calm when I told him I wanted to replace Emma, he realized. Especially because he was responsible for this disaster, he couldn't sit by idly as his plans crumbled. He chased after Eric, grabbing his arm. Maybe we could talk about this. I recognize now that I must have made a mistake. Eric brushed off Mark's clingy hands and said, I'm sorry, but the time for your recognizing your mistakes has passed. Eric checked his watch with an impassive expression and gave Mark one last look. The press conference should be starting right now. Mark's face paled. As he watched Eric leave the room, he pulled out his phone and quickly contacted his assistant, who was in a panic. John Burns is using the recent accident as a reason to withdraw from the film, the assistant said. Quick, look at the news! Due to his reclusive nature, John rarely accepted interviews. But because his interviews were so rare, when he did speak, people listened. The safety violation that led to my injury seems to have been carried out by a member of the production crew who has since disappeared. I wasn't tricked into protecting Emma. I did it because it was the right thing to do. The fact that somebody would go to these lengths to hurt us and spread such outlandish rumors is hard to accept. I no longer feel safe on the set. With a heavy heart, I am announcing my withdrawal from Hidden Expert. Looking directly into the nearest camera, he finally said, Please carefully consider the truth of what you hear in the future. Mark Hilton was left in shock. Eric's prediction had come true. Hidden Expert had indeed come to an end. Episode 384, John and Eric make a deal. In the wake of John's announcement, attendees of the press conference immediately began talking to one another. I don't blame him one bit, someone in the front row said. I would also be terrified to continue filming. I can't believe my ears, the person next to him said. I don't think John Burns has ever spoken this much outside of a movie during his entire career. I can't believe the producer tried to avoid responsibility by throwing the blame on Emma. What a jerk, the first reporter replied. Without waiting for any questions, John left the press conference as soon as he could. Margot, who had come along with him, 
blocked the media from pursuing him with further questions. When he saw how useful she was, John thought, Wow, I didn't realize I was missing a helper like this all along. Maybe I should ask Emma and Eric if she can work with me from now on. John, hurry up and get in the car, she called, interrupting his train of thought. He glanced at her and realized that although his path was clear, she was trapped by the crowd. He reached and pulled her into the car with him and out of the media site. After they were safely away, he said, You're supposed to help me stop the media, not become a human barrier. I don't actually have much experience doing this, she admitted sheepishly, running her fingers through her hair. I've only seen other people do this on TV. After seeing his expression change, she changed the subject. Is your arm okay? It's fine, he replied as he looked out the window. She fell silent, assuming he didn't feel like talking to her. After a moment, she blurted out, Where are we going now? Since I don't need to film, I'm going home, he answered. He'd actually been wondering if he could somehow convince her to come with him and trying to think of an excuse for needing her. Because of his low profile, the location of his home was not known to many. Although Margot tried to pay attention, she couldn't keep track of how many turns they made or the route they took. Does he even live in New York? She wondered. Do you have someone to help you when you get home? She asked. I think you're going to need some assistance. I can try to hire someone for you if you don't have anyone. And where are we going? I have a house in Connecticut, but I live there alone. He replied quickly. And you're right. With one arm out of commission, it's going to be hard to take care of myself. She looked at him, not knowing what he was thinking. Why am I even in the car with him? She wondered, is he expecting that I will be taking care of him? I do find him kind of charming, but he's a little odd. Are you looking for me to help you? She asked, feeling awkward. I'm supposed to be working for Emma, at least until Lisa comes back from visiting Luke's family. How nice of you to offer, he said, deliberately misunderstanding. Why don't I call Eric and see if that will work for them? After opening the door, he headed straight for his bedroom and left her in the living room. He called over his shoulder. Help yourself to whatever you want. I need to go make a phone call. He was eager to negotiate with Eric to find a way to keep Margot by his side. When Eric answered his phone, he was on the way back from the cocktail party. John's request was well-timed, and after hearing him out, Eric replied, I think we can make this happen if Margot is willing to work with you, but I have a proposal for you to think about first. Just tell me what you want, John said. I want you to participate in a new film I just invested in. Like before, you'll be working alongside Emma, but you'll do it for free. It's a deal, John agreed. The quickness of his response made Eric concerned for a moment. Aren't you worried I'm asking you to get involved in a terrible film? He asked. You wouldn't suggest that Emma act in something terrible, John said. And I know that you would never invest in something you thought was low quality. Although it's a good script, the director is a newcomer, Eric said. We're going to need your name as the main marketing tactic. This didn't bother John. He wasn't signed to an agency, so Eric could market him however he wanted. Send me the script later tonight, and I'll look it over. John responded. While it wasn't the first time Eric had invited John to take part in a film, it was the quickest that John had ever agreed to anything, 
aside from when he agreed to withdraw from Hidden Expert. But his new appreciation of Margot and his growing desire to spend time with her made him quick to consent. By the time Eric arrived home, Emma had already reviewed the script once and was looking over it a second time. She hadn't realized the film would be about a disaster, and she sat in silence for a while as she processed it. Eventually, Eric joined her on the couch. What do you think? he asked. It's very heavy, she replied. But I think it's worth a try. The film was called Weird Husband. Taking place 20 years in the future, the film was about a terrifying illness. The main characters were husband and wife, and the wife begins to notice gradual and strange changes in her husband. The story begins in the main character's hometown. The husband, who has dedicated his career as a doctor to helping others, ends up becoming patient zero for the new illness. I don't think there's a lot of good films in this genre, Eric commented. There's a gap in the domestic market that this production could fill. Do you know who's playing the husband? Emma asked. And I have some doubts about the role for myself. This movie requires a certain kind of actor. Do you really think I can do it? He glanced at the script in her hand and smiled confidently. I have a feeling this film will be the cornerstone of your acting career. She absorbed her husband's confidence in her and took hold of his hand. Okay, I'll do it. As for the male lead, I think we have someone lined up he said with a mysterious smile. And don't worry about it. He's good in this genre. We're also planning to keep the cast and filming location secret. We can start promoting the film once we've reached the halfway point. I'll focus on studying the script for now. As for promoting the movie, you're the expert, Emma said. But honestly... I'm not sure I can start immediately, given the concussion. Do you know when Richard wants to start filming? I must say, I've underestimated Richard, he responded. He's been preparing for quite some time. As soon as he has enough money, filming can start. Perhaps as early as the end of the month. She nodded thinking about everything she would need to get done before then. Aside from preparing herself for the role, she also wanted to resolve a few issues with her family. By the way, the wife in this film is in the military, so the martial arts you learned in Hidden Expert will be a good foundation. That's pretty lucky. She looked at him speculatively, then said, I'm not sure I believe luck had anything to do with this. When Eric just looked at her, she continued, I'm just wondering if you arranged to change some things in the story. Were you feeling bad that I wasn't able to use the training for the last film, so you changed the wife's career? He was surprised at how quickly his plan had been discovered. So... What was her original career? She asked. Episode 385. John has a lot to learn. She was a science fiction writer who was obsessed with plotting every detail of her made-up universe. Eric admitted. Then... Let's stick with that, Emma responded. Since the original writer chose that career for her, there must have been a good reason. Plus, didn't you tell me to treat the past as a form of experience? He held up his hands in surrender. I can't argue with that logic. 
Although either career would have been an interesting choice, I must admit that using a writer with no tactical planning or military skills would add more suspense, he thought. A disaster movie needs to have some suspense, or it'll fail. Later that evening, Jenna returned to the Miller household, just as her grandfather's lawyer was leaving. Panic rushed through her as she approached and asked him, Mr. Patel, are you leaving? Let me walk you out. No, no, he said nervously, hastening his pace toward the door. Don't let me disturb you. Her eyes narrowed with suspicion as she watched the lawyer leave. Her grandfather had clearly warned the lawyer to avoid her, which meant she needed to find out what he was up to. Her anxiety built as she called her assistant. Help me investigate why my grandfather was talking to the lawyer and see if you can find out by tomorrow. As she waited for her assistant to get back to her, she thought about her recent interactions with Emma, whose very existence seemed to be like an albatross around her neck. Nothing she did kept her younger sister down. At least the rumors I started around the film had an effect, she thought with relief. She doesn't have a film to act in, and everyone's avoiding her. If she had to keep seeing Emma's face show up on the TV or in theaters, she would lose her appetite. Late that night, John's house remained brightly lit. Since Margot had arrived, she had tried to familiarize herself with her surroundings with minimal success. There were so many rooms and small corridors that she couldn't seem to find her way from one end of the house to the next. She was becoming increasingly anxious over being away from her real job, helping Emma. And although John said that he needed her to stay, he was nowhere to be found. She spoke out loud into the empty room. How do I get out of here? Why would one person live in such a huge place? Where is he? She continued walking around to try and find him. John, who was in the bathtub, heard her footsteps, but didn't say anything. He kept his injured arm out of the water and pretended to be relaxing in the spa-style bathtub with his eyes closed. Where could he be? She muttered to herself as she pushed open the bathroom door. Her eyes immediately fell to his firm, muscled back before she started to back out. Did this really just happen? This is a scene straight out of a trashy romance novel, she thought. Unaware that he had manufactured this scene deliberately, she blushed and apologized. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'll go now. Since you're here, could you give me a hand? He suggested as he turned around and leaned over the edge of the bathtub. I'm afraid I can only take my clothes off. Putting them back on is a bit more difficult. Don't put them on then. She moved to the door, but his words stopped her in her tracks. If you insist, he said. He stood up from the water without making any movement to cover up. She let out a yelp until she realized he was actually wearing boxers. Margo was embarrassed and afraid. She touched her cheeks to find them burning hot. What a jerk, she thought. If I'd known he was such a creep, I would never have agreed to come here. What if he's more than a creep? What if he's gonna hurt me? What if he's a psycho axe murderer? There's no one else around to help me if he tries something, she thought frantically. She decided to call Emma, but in her panic, she accidentally dialed the wrong number. She blurted urgently into the phone. Emma, can you come pick me up? I'm scared John might try and kill me. There was a long pause before a male voice replied. This is John. She looked at her phone in horror. At the moment, killing is not one of my hobbies, but I can try and take it on if you want me to. 
he suggested. Her jaw dropped, unsure if he was joking. He sighed at her silence. Could you please come back and help me change my bandages? It's really hard to do this one-handed. No, she said. You really scared me. I want to go back to New York. If I get my housekeeper to come keep you company, will you help me then? He asked. You said you live alone, she said in an accusatory tone. The housekeeper's only in charge of cleaning the house. I can't ask her to help me take care of something like this. When the friendly housekeeper eventually arrived, Margot was finally able to relax. At least I won't be alone with this weirdo, she thought. However, the thought of trying to sleep in the same house as him made her uneasy. John's mood became more somber as he realized that he really had acted inappropriately and had scared her. Maybe I should take her back to New York after all, he thought. This sure has gone south in a hurry. If you can help me get dressed, I'll take you back to New York, he said. She eyed him suspiciously. Didn't you say you have nothing to film? Why would you go back to New York? A role for me just came up, he said. He'd already looked through the script of Weird Husband and decided it was right up his alley. He decided to return to his home in New York for a while, at least until Margot realized that she didn't need to be afraid of him. But because he wasn't great at communicating, Margot had no idea that he was returning to New York because he thought she would be more comfortable there. Regardless, she was looking forward to going back. He sighed at the happiness on her face at the thought of leaving his house. Is the prospect of being my assistant truly that bad? Doesn't she know that other people would claw and fight to have this chance? He wondered. He thought of the way that Emma and Eric seemed to understand each other so easily and sighed again. Perhaps good things come to those who wait, he thought. But I've never been a very patient person. Episode 386 Why do we need her? After John withdrew from Hidden Expert, the production crew decided to stop filming. They could have just replaced him, but this film was made specifically for John. No actor wanted to try and follow in his footsteps. Their other option was to replace him with a newcomer. But if they did that, the film would lose all value and meaning, and the money invested in the project would just end up being money lost. Not everyone has the ability to sell tickets like John. After a couple of days, the rumor about Emma keeping ghosts slowly disappeared. The hype had been overshadowed by other celebrity news. Meanwhile, under pressure from Kaleidoscope, the police eventually found Mary, the person in charge of inspecting Emma's harness. She admitted that she had received money from someone, but she'd never seen the person in real life. When the police traced the calls she received, they found that the calls were made from public phones. She'd received the money in cash that she had picked up from a designated location. The investigator was rigorous and cautious. Their methods were skillful, like they'd done this before. A little while later, Kaleidoscope and the police released a statement explaining the entire incident. Although their leads ended at Mary, the police warned the public that they would continue to search for the true culprit. As soon as the statement was released, the media and the people online were in shock. This was the first time since Emma's comeback that she had revealed the unseen darkness of the industry to the public. 
Eric's motive was simple. He wanted to tell those that were wary of Emma that she was framed. Of course, he no longer cared if others wanted her in their films or not, because her current role was already a hit. He believed she would spread her wings after the release of the film. Jenna should be thankful that she has a smart assistant, Emma said as she put down her scribble-filled script. She then looked at Eric and said, Actually, we should follow her assistant. Right now, your main priority is to prepare for your film. Don't let small things like this bother you. Our days are booked solid, he said. Her actions completely show how envious and afraid she is of me. I should be happy that my living every day is torture for her, she said. She stared straight ahead for a moment, then said, I'll be extra careful from now on. Eric wanted to teach Jenna a lesson on the business stage. But her business was the Miller family's business. If he were to make a move, Emma would feel guilty and become more forgiving toward Jenna. But he didn't need to worry because someone was bound to make the move first. Jenna's desk was littered with information her assistant had gathered from investigating her grandfather's lawyer. From what I can tell, it seems your grandfather has written his will, Jenna's assistant said as he stood at the foot of her desk. Also, also what? She asked. My contact at the law firm said that your grandfather has decided to hand his entire business to Emma, the assistant revealed after a moment of hesitation. Angered by this information, she scrunched the paper in her hands into a ball and said, So I'm sitting here, trying to do my best as acting president. Meanwhile, he's decided to hand everything over to Emma? Why did he choose her over me? She said. What are you going to do now? Her assistant asked. What am I going to do? Of course, I can't let someone else take over. She said. Since I'm here, why do we need her? She already got married into her dream family. Why does she need to fight over the Miller family business with me? Do you have a plan? The assistant asked. Let me think about it, she replied. The incident with the harness had already been discovered. If she wanted to harm Emma again, it was practically impossible. So the person she truly needed to deal with was Jeff Miller. Let me go home and have a chat with my grandfather, she said. You are the oldest grandchild. It's only natural for you to be the successor of the family business. No matter what, I'll stay by your side, the assistant said, taking the opportunity to reveal his loyalty. She nodded her head as she realized that this man was the last remaining person she could trust, even though he was just her assistant. Later that night, Jenna returned to the Miller family home. As she entered the front door, she spotted Susan. She gave her a sharp glare and then headed straight for her grandfather's study room. Grandfather, it's Jenna, she announced. I want to have a chat with you. Your grandfather's not in the study room, Susan said in a cold tone. Jenna then turned to Susan and said, You've been good to us, but this doesn't change the fact that you stole someone's husband and secretly had a love child. You and your daughter are shameless. Did you think your daughter could do no wrong? She's actually the sneakiest person I know. She tricked Grandfather into writing in his will that he would hand the entire Miller family business to her. Just know that as long as I'm here, I'm going to make both of your lives hell, even if Emma did get married. Susan became angry. 
But then she smiled in relief as she realized that Emma would never do something tricky in secret. I once thought you just had a temper, but now I finally realized you are simply evil, Susan said. She then returned to her bedroom and made a decision. Previously, she was hesitant to do what she wanted to do because she still had an ounce of sentiment for the family. But now, she finally knew what was most important to her. Susan held in her tears as she gathered the courage to pick up her phone. She then called her best friend. Abby, can you help me with a favor? I need to book a hall and I wanna invite the media. I wouldn't put an end to some old family matter. We'll talk about it in person, she said. Episode 387. I can't and I won't. Over the next several days, Emma decided to concentrate all her time on fitness and understanding her character. Eric organized for her to join a writer's chat group to better understand the writer's minds. It was at that time that she discovered, from conception to completion, how much time and energy was invested into writing a story. Everything required careful planning, from the world that the story was set in down to the tiniest facial detail of a supporting character. To immerse herself in the script, Emma found a whole heap of foreign disaster films and imagined herself as the main characters. She also took into consideration whether people would feel shocked by her character once it appeared on screen. Emma ended up studying the script and films for an entire day. When Eric arrived home, he discovered Emma was still in the same spot he had left her in earlier in the day. He walked over, stole the script from her hands, and turned off the television. It's time for rest, he said. Just a little while longer, she replied. No, he said, and convinced her to return to the bedroom for some rest. She pretended to try and take the script from his hands, but he simply held it up and out of her reach. Then she wrapped her arms around his waist and said, It feels good to have someone that cares. He lowered his arms and hugged her. You should do some exercises to stretch out your muscles, he said. If you let me cook dinner for you, that would stretch out my muscles. Now that I don't have to be on the runway, am I finally allowed to be in the kitchen? She asked. Just because you won't be on the runway doesn't mean you can get hurt. If you were to burn yourself or cut yourself or get any scars, it won't look good on camera, he replied. What man would try so hard to prevent his wife from entering the kitchen, she said as she giggled. Anyhow, the writer in the film is also a housewife, so she'll eventually need to go into the kitchen anyway. Filming is different, he replied. This time, the filming schedule will be packed. When that time comes, you'll realize how precious your free time right now is. Well, if I can't cook, then you can't either. Let's just get the maid to do it. Take a nap with me instead, she said. He looked at her tired eyes and said, Let's go get changed then. They headed into the walk-in closet and then returned to the bedroom. Not long after they got into bed, he said, Your mom wants to see you. Do you want to see her? No, I don't want to see her, she replied quickly. 
I'll let her know for you then, he said. A few minutes later, she changed her mind and said, What time and where does she want to meet? You'll meet at Kaleidoscope. I'll give you some time alone, he replied. She then buried herself in his arms and quickly fell asleep. Inside the dark room, Eric wasn't tired. He was deep in thought because he knew that Susan had contacted the media. If she didn't have something huge planned, why would she make such a fuss, he thought. What could be so important that she'd contact the media? While all this was going on, John had moved back into his New York home. However, Margot always found an excuse to return home. She would arrive early in the morning and leave again every night. That night, after she helped John replace his bandages, she packed up her stuff to leave. But he suddenly grabbed onto the corner of her shirt and asked, Can you stay tonight to help me practice some scenes? No, I can't and I won't, she replied. Is he kidding? I've already tried my best to avoid being alone with him. Yet here he was asking me to act with him, she thought. If she agreed, wouldn't she be digging her own grave? You don't need to know how to act. You can play Emma's role. I'll lead, he said and placed the script on the table. His voice was indifferent. I'll be heading on to set at the end of the month, and I haven't prepared. Don't tell me you want Emma's first real film to be a flop. Her heart raced, but eventually calmed down as she replied, Fine, I'll do it. Although he managed to make her stay, he realized he was nowhere near as important to her as Emma was. That realization didn't sit right with him, and he wanted to teach her a lesson. Not only was this his first time pursuing a girl, but it was also his first time using such a roundabout way to get close to someone. He didn't like places with a lot of people. He didn't like to live in New York, where he could hear the traffic coming and going. He didn't like to have back-and-forth conversations. But for Margot, he tolerated it all. So what else did she want from him? She put down her leather handbag and sat down opposite John. What do you need me to do? she asked. He looked at her depressed and anxious expression and couldn't take it. He grabbed the script from her and bluntly asked, If I was to pursue you, how would you feel? Her eyes grew wide in surprise. You you must be joking, right? She asked. Yeah, I was just joking, he said, playing along. That was a line from the script. Oh, okay, she said, as her heart almost jumped out of her chest. She playfully punched him in the chest and said, You tricky bastard. He raised the script in his hand and said, Come on, let's practice. Okay, she replied. By the way, when can I remove the sling on my arm? He asked. Don't worry, it'll definitely be before you start filming. She had already flipped through the script and knew the rough basis of the story. She liked it. She could already tell that Emma and John working together on this would make the film spectacular. And if she were to help him practice, it would be considered a form of contribution, right? Her only issue with helping him is the doctor in the film was quite frightening, just like him. You know... The only reason I live in seclusion is because I can't be bothered to socialize. I'm not actually weird, he explained. Who would have thought that the public would end up making me sound so mysterious to the point where you're so frightened of me? 
Margot just smiled and awkwardly ran her fingers through her hair.